Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Sharazad Kotar, postdoctoral fellow at Neuroscience Research Australia. My background has been in neurobiology, and during my PhD, I studied the relationship between stress and Alzheimer's disease. So on similar lines today, I'm going to talk to you about stress, anxiety, and dementia. To give you a quick overview of my talk, first I'll speak about the different types of stress, how the body reacts to these stresses, and then the, the relationship between stress and anxiety, how these are related to dementia, and lastly, talk to you about the therapeutic approaches that are available till date. So the term stress is so commonly used, and even more so now during these uncertain times. Let's see how we define stress. Stress is defined as either a physical, mental, or an emotional factor that causes bodily or mental tension. Let's take an example. Say somebody has been given an opportunity to be promoted at work. It could be taken in a positive way. Say, for example, the person will think, hey, I have this whole opportunity of increasing my skill set, and I can, uh, I'll have new opportunities. Or else somebody can also think in a negative way by saying, there's too much of work, there's too much of work pressure. How, how would I manage all of that? So this example is just to tell you that a, a similar situation can be perceived by uh, different people in different ways. It's just a matter of perception. At this point, I want to tell you, not all stress is bad stress. As you can see in the graph, a bit of stress is good. Performance increases, but only till a certain point of time, after which that, that, that good stress turns into bad stress and performance decreases, and also what's seen that if stress continues, it's detrimental to the body. How does the body react to stress? We've all been in this situation when either our heart rate increases, perspiration, sweating increases, or we have shortness of breath. Why does that happen? It's the way the body defends us in a stressful situation, and it's preparing the body to be either in a flight mode or a fight mode. So now we're going to see how the body responds to stress. I have a beautiful brain diagram shown in front of you. And I'm not going to get into the details, but I thought it would be important to tell you how when a signal is perceived by the brain, there is a complex cascade of signals that are initiated and what happens in the end is production of this hormone called as cortisol. Cortisol is also called as a stress hormone. And once these levels of cortisol increase in the body, luckily we have a feedback loop which helps us bring the body into homeostasis. That means brings the body back to balance. We can control the levels of cortisol. Short pulses of cortisol is very important for the body. It gives you energy. It improves the immune system. But if cortisol remains for a longer period of time in high levels, that is detrimental to the body. Let's now see what evidence we have for stress as a risk factor for dementia. There is evidence from animals and from humans. The animal system is important in research because you can understand the underlying mechanisms of complex processes like stress and dementia. So what do we know from these animal models? Chronic stress reduces memory and it increases a protein that is related to dementia, which is the amyloid beta protein and the tau protein. Now let's see a few examples from humans. There's something called as the post-traumatic stress disorder. What is that? Say somebody has had a very traumatic situation in their life and has not been able to recover from it completely. Say after a few months or a few years, actually, any kind of a trigger, any kind of a stimulus from, from the external environment can remind the individual 
of that traumatic experience and bring back those bad memories. This is what happens mostly with war veterans and they are known to be susceptible to dementia. A few more examples. Say someone has had a bad childhood experience or any kind of an adverse adversity during their early childhood, those precious early life. That is also known to increase the risk for dementia. There are, on the other hand, numerous studies which have shown any kind of a traumatic brain injury, say by a road accident or a, while playing a sport, any severe brain injury, a head injury, is known to increase the chances of developing dementia. I just like to point out when we say hires the risk or makes it susceptible, doesn't mean that everybody gets it. It's just that it increases the chances of developing dementia later on in life. What I would like to show you now is some brain scans. And a brain scan of two people, one on the left-hand side who has not, has not experienced post-traumatic disorder or any kind of a stressful uh, a trauma, a healthy individual, let's call it a healthy individual. On the other side of somebody who has experienced PTSD, the brain structure of the person who's had a PTSD trauma has reduced, the volume has reduced, it's shrunk. And what you can also see in the bottom left is that PTSD affects the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a structure that is responsible for memory function. Those individuals who have had a PTSD has a change in the volume of hippocampus. What we can see over here is how stress is affecting the brain structure and then affects the actual um, the function of the brain, which is related to that structure. In this case, it is memory. We have spoken about stress as a risk factor for dementia, but there is evidence that dementia impairs the stress response. What we know in people who have early stage dementia, they're also called as mildly cognitive impairment. These individuals have high levels of cortisol. And unfortunately, even their negative feedback loop is dysregulated. What does that mean? These people cannot get their cortisol levels back in balance. Increased level of cortisol affects the brain structures, affects memory. And it kind of is like, um, when we talk about stress and dementia, it's like a chicken and egg story because we have evidence from both the ways. We have evidence that stress is a risk factor for dementia and dementia also goes and impairs the stress response. Now I'm going to move gears and talk to you about anxiety. Stress and anxiety have signs and symptoms which overlap, namely, chronic fatigue, nervousness, chronic arousal. So these kind of symptoms are seen in both stress and anxiety. Like stress, anxiety is also known to be a risk factor for dementia. What I would like to show you here is when we look at progression of dementia, there are different phases. The preclinical phase is that in which the individual has very subtle memory troubles and problems which then advances to the prodromal phase in which the person has mild cognitive impairments. And this eventually develops into severe memory impairments, which is then diagnosed as dementia. What is seen is that anxiety is known to be predominant during the prodromal phase of dementia. It's not only anxiety, but there are other neuropsychiatric symptoms like agitation, anxiety, depression, Empathy, all of these, they are clustered together during this phase. And what is known as, it's this cluster of symptoms which pushes the individual from prodromal phase to dementia. Just to give you a few facts and figures on anxiety and dementia, around 14% of patients with dementia are known to have clinical anxiety. There has been now evidence which is increasing as it shows that anxiety is a risk factor for dementia. And when we look at some of the recent reviews, some of the systematic reviews which look at 
huge number of studies together, not individual, but all of them clubbed in together. What we've seen is that those who've had a history of anxiety are known to be 1.6 times more susceptible to dementia. Speaking of stress and anxiety, now I'm going to move towards what are the therapeutic approaches available. As we know, there is no treatment for dementia as of yet. There are ongoing clinical trials. And from the point of stress view, there are trials which are targeting the brain cortisol level. You'll be pleased to know that this trial is happening in Australia. And let's keep our fingers crossed until we get the results. On the other side for anxiety, anxiolytics, which reduce anxiety, are commonly used. Say, for example, benzodiazepine. But there are some negative um, side effects that are seen, for example, loss of memory function. So this drives us to non-pharmacological approaches and therapies. What is known to be affected? Music therapy is known to be affected as it soothes the person who's stressed and anxious. Also exercise, mindfulness training. This kind of training helps the person to be in the present and not have thoughts about either the past or the future. And lastly, cognitive pain, uh, behavioral therapy. In this therapy, the person is taught to have positive coping strategies to then change their negative moods and thoughts to positive ones. With this, I'd like to conclude by saying that there is evidence that anxiety is a modifiable risk factor for dementia. What does that mean? If we can treat anxiety early, we can also prevent dementia. As I earlier explained, there is this chicken and egg question that makes the relationship between stress, anxiety, and dementia complicated. And hence, to understand the mechanism, to come up with more treatments and therapies, it's a bit challenging. In the last five years, there have been multiple studies that are looking at anxiety, anxiety and dementia in particular. And on this note, I'd like to tell you that in our team, we are looking at the Path Through Life study, which is an Australian cohort. And we are seeing how anxiety symptoms over 12 years affect different memory and cognitive functions. Lastly, I'd like to end with by saying that our increased knowledge on the relationship between stress, anxiety, and dementia will help us in the prevention of dementia. Thank you for attention.